Hey, how are you doing, ladies and gentlemen? And now you know you have been waiting for this interview for the past week since I announced it, because today we have a very, very special guest. And he's a first-time guest on Kiara's channel. He's one of the most genius Vedic astrologers that I came across. And uh, once I heard his video about how actually he got into Jyotish and what he did to actually learn Jyotish, uh, you know, completely uh, humbled me as a person after hearing his story, and I knew I had to get him here on my channel. So without further ado, further ado please help me welcome Vedic astrologer Ernest Wilhelm. Welcome, sir, to Kara's channel. Thank you. And um, just to correct, my name is Ernst without the second E. Oh, Ern. Okay. Ernst. Got it. E R N S T. Oh, Ernst. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Unique. Okay. So, um, I was very mesmerized by the way you teach Vedic astrology, and I saw your videos on YouTube, and I saw how much detail you went into and how much you knew as far as the Shastra were concerned. And so before we you know, get into your knowledge, I want to know who you are as a person and how you got started into the world and this ocean of Vedic astrology. Okay, well, I was always interested in astrology. Um, I grew up as an athlete, though, martial arts, then racing bikes. And all my money was going towards my, you know, my career as a cyclist. I remember going to a bookstore once and finding out that there was all these ephemeris and planetary houses and that you didn't just look at a sun sign, they actually calculated the whole chart. And I really wanted to buy those books, just had this great desire to buy them, but it was 70 bucks, you know, and I didn't have it. I was 16, 17, so I kind of put it aside. But then years later, um, I was in Milwaukee and I'd been studying martial arts there and I was moving and the week that I, my last week there, I lived with a friend, an old hippie, and he introduced me to a friend of his in another state and said he would have me read, her read my chart. So she read my chart over the phone for 90 minutes and then he kicked me off the phone because the phone rates were real high. But I decided to go visit her on my way home the next day. She was right in the 750 miles in the midway. So I drove by and I visited her and the whole, I just was speeding the whole way. I couldn't wait to get there. I'm thinking she's going to read my chart and tell me so many more things and we'll just talk about my chart forever. So I get there, she feeds me a vegetarian meal, then she, you know, she found out I was vegetarian, then she sits me down, she talks to me a little bit about the weather, <laughs> then she takes me to her office and I'm mm -hmm. like finally, you know, she's going to read my chart some more. And she just proceeded to show me how to calculate my horoscope. And I to calculate horoscopes and then she'd get me an ephemeris and a table of houses and some beginning lessons. I'm like, why are you teaching me how to read a chart? I want to talk about my chart. But she didn't do that and then she fed me dinner and tucked me away in bed and she woke me up at six in the morning and kicked me out of her house, right? So she just essentially taught me to calculate a chart and she didn't say, oh, you're, I see in your chart that you'll be an astrologer. She just taught me how to calculate the chart. Wow. And so, then I drove home and um, luckily I was driving through North Dakota and Montana where there was no traffic so I was cruising at nine, 95 miles an hour in my sports car reading her lessons like a fool and um, I made it home safely and got through her lessons and I got home and I calculated my sister's chart and I tried to read it and essentially made a fool of myself trying to figure out the square aspects and the quintile and all this stuff. Yeah. And it was sort of embarrassing, and to this day, my little sister has no respect for me as an astrologer. <laughs> but uh, and then I kind of put those away, and I got um, I was really I was heavily involved in yoga at the time, and I decided I wanted to go to India, so I started saving money for India. Um, but as things befell me, I instead of going to India, I injured my knee on the same day that I met the fatal attraction, right, you know, uh -huh. talk about an omen. I was actually going to go to India in two weeks, two weeks before I wow. blew my knee out. So this girl kind of had some ideas for me to work with one of her friends to do um, a business in Japan. Um, so I said, well, geez, I can't really go touring around Europe with a backpack in India because my knees thrashed. So I um, had a sort of a difficult relationship, and at the end of it, I was heartbroken, first girlfriend, broken-hearted, beat up, um, but I had a copy of my chart, and I had yeah. on my chart, I had her planet. She had gotten a compatibility with a person, so that person sent me my chart with her planets on it. So 
I asked my mom to send those books to me, and then I hit the bookstores, and in literally two weeks, I was like, oh, no wonder. And I didn't, I was like done with it. So instead of like being brokenhearted, I want to shoot myself for a year, just for two weeks, I wanted to shoot myself. So I was like, wow. And at the time, I was like really in the nature path, being healing. I said, you know, and I always fix everything in my life through diet and fasting and exercise. And I was like, geez, you know, that doesn't really fix a broken heart really well. So yeah. I decided right then and there, I'm going to become an astrologer. This is what I'm going to do. Um, because it just helps so much in that critical painful time. So then I started studying Western for three years and after I started a Western practice and it got to where when I looked at a chart I got nausea because of all the psychology. And at the time I had Pluto crossing my fourth house cusp which is a very intense psychological thing. I was just sick with the whole ego. So I look at the chart and I'd say I'd see look at a person's chart and I have a lot of compassion for them because of all the psychological complexes that each of us carry around. I'm like, what the hell do you do? It's like we got this gem of the soul, and in that yeah. gem we have, it's tangled in a ball of yarn, a string, and knotted up. And trying to psychologically work that, it's like taking one little string and untying it, and then taking this little thread out, and five years, you know, a hundred lifetimes later, right, you finally can untangle all those knots. And yeah. it just made me sick to even look at a chart from a purely psychological Western perspective. I said, the thing to do, it's just to drop a match on that yaw ball of yarn, right? And that's Pluto mm -hmm. right there. Just yeah. burn it all. And then there you got the gem less. So I couldn't look at Western charts. I wanted something more, but I didn't know what it was. So I said, well, I guess I've been preparing to be an astrologer for three years, and now I have no goals, so I'm just going to go to an ashram. So I went to an ashram, and in the ashram, um, within the first month of being there, I had a dream that I needed to look into Vedic astrology. So I ordered a copy of Brihat Parashara on my 25th birthday. I called my mom, begged her to use her credit card um, from the Bodhi tree. They luckily had a copy, and I was shocked. I didn't, say, I didn't think they would, but I'd heard about this book, so they sent it to me, and I got it a few days later. And I just started calculating everything in Parashara by hand and trying every technique in there. Two weeks later, there was an Italian guy there who had lived in India for several years and studied um, Vedic astrology with a Brahmin. And he asked me to read his Western chart. I said, I get stomachache if I read your Western chart. He begged me to because he'd never had a Western reading. Mm -hmm. So before lunch one day, I had some time and he came and we looked at his chart for a few minutes. And I just rattled off a few things. Um, after lunch, he came up to me and he said, I called my mom in Italy and she's sending you my whole library plus my astrology software. So a month later, I had this crate from Italy with every uh, every Vedic astrology book that was written in English up to that date. Because this guy was wealthy. You know, he had a Rolex, $10,000 Rolex. Wow. A $10,000 coral mala, you know? Yeah. So he, I, got it, I got it all set up, and I was just, I was set. And he didn't say many things about my chart, but he said a few things. He said that I was a bhakti. And I just started laughing at him. I'm like, me, a bhakti. <laughs> and it turned yeah. out later I proved I was a bhakti, right? Yeah. Um, he said I would marry a black wife. I said, a black wife? He goes, you know, dark. He, his English wasn't good. Well, I married a girl from India, right? Yeah. He also said, he said, he said, you'll learn not just how to predict the future, you know, the events, and when people will make money. You'll be able to predict how much money. You know, wow. details. He goes, you'll be able to quantify things. I said, oh, really? So then I left the ashram and started my practice. And that's a lot of the work I've been trying to do with astrology is using the full, all the techniques in Parshar in a holistic way, not just to predict this is when something's going to happen, right. but predict how much. So we can say, well, in this period of your life, you made 60 grand. Well, in this period, you're going to make 100 grand. Because we, if Parshar actually gives us the math to quantify the planets. And these are techniques that are not even being used, like Ishta and Kashta, Shuba Ashuba Fala, and the Avashtas. Those are the core of Parshar, and nobody uses them. They right. just use yogas. And, but there's a whole art to quantifying a yoga. So two people both have the same yoga. One is the president of, you know, is the manager of Burger King, the other one's the president. What's the difference? And of course, a lot of the difference is multiple yogas, but there's also quantifying the yogas and quantifying anything, the automobile, the paycheck, the beauty of your spouse. So we know Jupiter and the moon and the seventh will make you have a beautiful spouse. Well, good. Yeah. 
but someone will have a more beautiful spouse, okay? Right. But their Jupiter is brighter, and therefore is going to create more beauty. So um, what I've been working on actually the last, you know, since 2004, the focus on my research has really been all these Parshar techniques to try to finally make that guy's prediction come true, <laughs> that nice. I can predict the quantity and not just the what and the when, but the how much. So wow. and with, with Vedic astrology has those principles. No other culture has that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not being used in India, but India has preserved it for us. And um, so if we want to, we can spend, you know, decades trying to learn how to use it. <laughs> well, how long did it take you to master the fact of telling somebody and quantifying the actual amount of their wealth? Like, okay, you must have made this much. I mean, how complicated is it? And it, how long It's very it complicated. And what I try to do is come up with the foundation. So I'll look in their past and I'll say, okay, this planet was good, say, to for 20 Virupas or points. And I'll say, how much did mm -hmm, you make? Right. And they'll say, oh, I made, you know, 80 grand. And now I see they're in a 40 points. I would predict you're going to pull about 160 now. Uh, you know, I would double it in accordance with that. And the reason that's, it's always right. good to work with what you know about them to improve the predictions because each planet, the chart as a whole has a capacity for wealth. So we look at one chart and the capacity for wealth is huge and another person chart the capacity for wealth is low and Jamie Sutras helps us with that. And getting that quantity into a number is very hard. Your capacity for wealth is one million, okay, is very hard. But if you know there was a time where they made half a million, it's easier to see the time where they're going to make one million or a quarter million or whatever. So while we can make some guesses, I certainly haven't mastered being able to say, you're going to be a millionaire um, in 5.6 million, you know, is, a, right. is the most you're ever going to make. But if we work with their charts and past times, we can kind of be more accurate with the present times by taking the quantities in respect to their own chart. But there's so many things that contribute to the wealth potential. Um, Jaimini has some, Parashara has some, Jaiminis are more important. Um, that if you just miss one of those for some reason, then you're going to guess the wrong wealth potential. So it's nicer just to ask them about a past time and then predict the accurate wealth in the future. Well, like in uh, Pirat Parashra Hora Shastra, they use the Hora, Hora of the Sun, Hora of the Moon concept, and then the Rupa Virupa is coincide with the Ashtavarka transits. Now, in Gemini, I know there's only the Karakas that you're using. How is these two systems, are they able to uh, pinpoint exactly the same result, or they have different quantities? Okay, of okay. Parashar and Gemini are doing completely different things. And to do uh -huh. astrology well, you have to do both of them. Because what Gemini is saying, Gemini is saying, I'm going to teach you how to see who and what that person is and what's going to be in their life. What are they going to do professionally? How great they'll be? How wealthy they'll be? Will, if they exist or don't exist, will it have made a difference? Meaning, some people, whether they're born or not, makes no difference to the world. Other people, hadn't they been born, there would be a hole in the world that you just can't replace with a corporate number. So Jamie lets us see that. Jamie lets us see children, how many? Jamie lets us see um, length of life, length of life of loved ones, marriage, yes or no. It does all those things most accurately. The techniques that we find in the Parashara books on those subjects regularly don't work. Like for instance, there's 43 techniques in my stack of classical texts on predicting the amount of children. 16 of them work 4 out of 10 times. The mm -hmm. rest don't even work 4 out of 10 times. Why is that? Because they're not good techniques. Because Parashara system astrology does not answer that question. Jamini does. If, the, if it comes to what is in this life, who they are, and their spiritual capacity, Jamini answers that. So Jamini is the, I, I call it the astrology of birth, what you're going to have in your life. The concrete things, and also the concrete who you are. Even to the extent of do you use logic as a primary mode of thinking, or do you use intuition as a primary mode of thinking? Jamini answers all those things. It's, it's the subtleties of what Jamini tells about a person is profound. It also talk, touch, indicates things that indicate you're going to be a chronically sick person. It doesn't get into the details of the disease, but it gives a foundation for you're going to have the karma of chronically illness. So the Parashara system 
is all about the ups and downs we have with everything in our life. So if I want to see, oh, are you going to have children? I look at Jamie. If I want to see how many children you're going to have, I look at Jamie. When I want to see when you're going to have children and when the kids are going to drive you crazy or have stress in their mm -hmm. life, I'm just going to use Parashar with the ups Parashar. and downs with those things. Okay. And with Jamie, we can predict the entry into our life of things, when the children come, and also the exit, when things die. Okay, But between that birth and death, so many things happen, right? Mm -hmm. That's the Parashar system. So I call the Jamie system the system of birth and death. What's born? and when it dies. And Parashar is the system of life. What happens between birth and death? Between the two, okay. Yeah, and so if, if an astrologer wants to predict a person's career, they can't do it without Jamini. It just cannot be done. Um, if a person wants to predict the capacity for a person's wealth, it just can't be done. There's, and Jamini's system is so simple. It's the easiest system. It could be taught to a 10-year-old. But Jamini encoded his sutras so that wow. The wisest person can spend two years on one sutra sometimes. One sutra took me two years to understand. Wow. And for two years, every spare moment, I was thinking this sutra. And I just married my wife. Mm -hmm. And I, we'd be together, and I'd be thinking, I do the same. Sutra yeah. on a trot. And she would look at me, and she goes, what are you thinking about? I go, oh, you, of course. And she would quote the sutra. You know, I so do the knew, same. She knew exactly what I was thinking for two years, right? Yeah. At least there was a sutra bearing on marriage, OK? Yeah. <laughs> and then two years later, I was walking through the house. All of a sudden, I said, boom, this part has to be decoded to this number. I went home, I, and I went, sat down, tried it out. And finally, two years later, one sutra is done, right? So that's how the difficulty of some Jamini is. He wrote it so that we have to think for years on even one sutra sometimes. And so even though his technique is so simple, the way he gives it, we cannot learn it until we really have studied. Parashar, on the other hand, tells us exactly how to make a calculation in plain Sanskrit, but it doesn't tell us what to do with any of the calculations. He gives right. us the exact avashtas. Yeah, it's doesn't a doesn't tell us language. what to do with them. Yeah, yeah. So we have, you know, four measurements of strengths and five avashtas. Well, how many ways can you mix those nine things up? Thousands exactly. of ways, right? Right. And he doesn't tell us how to mix them up. So the, my research since... Um, 2004 has just been trying to figure out how to mix those ingredients and I'm teaching that now in my um, current courses on my video website and um, but the 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 the, um, the schools of Jamie and Parshar need to be held hand in hand in fact the last sutra of Jamie's first part he says Hora Adaya Siddha this sutra means several things one thing it means is that we have to look at other texts for the things that are not included in Jaimini. For instance, Jaimini doesn't tell us the dignities or planetary relationships, any of that kind of stuff. Hora, Adaya means Hora, etc., which means the Hora Varga, etc. Siddha means perfection. So he's saying perfection will come from using the Varga charts, the Hora, Drakana, Chaturkamsha. So after working with Jaimini full time for four years, I realized for me to advance more in Jaimini, I need to go back to the last sutra of the first pada, which is Hora Daya Siddha, perfection through the Hora and other Varga charts. And the only great book on Varga charts was Parashar. So I thought I'd jump into Parashar for a few months and work on my Vargas and figure it all out and get back to Jaimini. Well, it's, yeah. what is it, nine years later, I'm finally getting ready to go back to Jaimini after spending nine years on finally integrating and figuring out what Parashar wants us to do. Wow. I can't tell you how profound the avashtas are when they're done right. I mean, I've been teaching it to a few people, and I've all said, wow, this is the missing link in astrology. It's like sometimes you can't see something in the chart. Laji Tati avashtas 90% of the time answers it. I see. Now, like in Germany, they use Charadasha. In Parashar, they're using Vimostri Dasha. Do you keep them separate, or do you use only one, or you mix them together? How okay. do you... Um, Jaimini does give Rashi dashes, uh -huh. um, but then he also says, um, if I remember the quote, he says, Udaya Siddha. Udaya is another name for Vimshatri Dasha. So in his Dasha chapter, he says Udaya Siddha, which means the Uda Dasha, which is a name of Vimshatri because Uda is the moon, is uh -huh. perfect. So he actually recommends the use of Vimshatri. 
And I use Ram Shatri a lot with Jamie. Um, in fact, I've predicted all the elections I've ever predicted. I've never failed an election. I've always just used Jaimini principles with Vimshatri Dasha. And using the, Jaimini has a method of seeing um, the planets that will raise a person to height. And based on the Dasha's running and how high a planet can raise a person, elections can be predicted to 100% accuracy. Um, so, yeah, you definitely want to use Vimshatri with that. However, you don't really want to use, well, you can use Rashi Dasas with the J Parashar. Parashar's principles are more quantifying principles. So say we got Jupiter in 10th, and that's considered nice, right? Jupiter right. in 10th saves you from all kinds of trouble. Mm -hmm. So if you're in trouble and then you go to the Dasha of uh, the 10th Rashi with Jupiter there, things will probably get better, depending on Jupiter's quality though, right? If Jupiter's good quality, it'll get a lot better. But, right. but again, if Jupiter's beat up, it won't. So we want to use Parashar anytime we want to see the quantity of something. I see. And then we can be more accurate with the Jaimini because Parashar is all, it has so much to do with quantity. But like I said, Jaimini is more about predicting the concrete times that things come in and that t things leave. So say we see a person's going to get married. Well, we can just analyze it and analyze all the marriage factors to see how great their marriage will be. That's going to be their quantity of marriage. So say in the Navamsha, Venus is exalted. The ninth cusp lord in the Navamsha is in a friend sign. And they're all aspected by, and conjunct only by friend planets. Then they're going to have a fantastic marriage. And we can, we can use Parashar to see how lucky this person is going to be. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at Jamie and say, oh, marriage gets triggered at this time. Um, nice. And how good is the spouse going to be? Well based on their chart and the planets that are indicating the marriage, how good those are based on the Parashar system or the quantification system. I see. Yeah. Now, when you were talking about you cannot predict a career of a person just to Parashra, um, there's this unique concept of using the Hora and the Lord of that Hora. You know how you divide the sunrise and sunset yeah. into three parts? You look at that Hora planet, if you're born at the 7 p.m., that means Mercury is strong. And you look at the lord of that Mercury that brings you the wealth, that means it's he, he, Mercury's lord is actually going out there working yes. for you. And so it has, have you worked with that concept? Because there's, uh, there's, a, there's a few techniques like that to see which planet will give wealth. Okay. And it's, Okay, so it'll say this dash, the wealth is going to come from this dasha. Ja Priya Jataka has one. There's a technique you mentioned. There's also a technique of looking at the, the looking at a planet's Shad Varga lords, lords, Rashi Hor, Drekana, and so on. They're lords. Mm -hmm. And the lord, the pl whatever planets rule the dasha lord, that planet will give money. So if your dasha lord is in the Shad Vargas of Jupiter most often, somehow Jupiter will give you money. Yeah. But getting money is different than um, career. So for instance, Jupiter may give me money, and I might have a terrible Jupiter in a way, but going into a wealth dasha, so my children gets ran over by the mailman, and I get $20 million. See, right. Jupiter's children give me money. Right. Right? So with Jamini, what Jamini does, what is career? Well, we think of career, look at it this way. If you had just met me, you wouldn't feel like you knew me until you ask what I did, right? Yeah. We don't really feel like we know someone until we know what they do. It's one of the first things we ask people, what do you do? Do, yeah. You know, so if I tell you, oh, remember Doug Stefanovic? And you say, Doug who? I say, you know, Doug Stefanovic. You know, the guy, blonde hair, you know, 5'9", really fast bike racer. You'll go, I can't remember. If I say, remember, or no, forget the bike racer part. Forget I said the bike racer part, you know. But if I say, remember Doug, the bike racer? You go, oh, yeah, Doug, the bike racer. Or I say, Doug, the lawyer? You go, oh, yeah, Doug, the lawyer. So what a person does is integral to who they are. And Jamie goes about answering the question of who of our career based on who we are, what we innately are as an inspired aspect of our soul. And he doesn't use the 10th house itself as a secondary thing. It's the, it's the Atmakarika, the self-planet, the lagna and the pada, which is the, the base of the lagna, the foot of the lagna, or the result of the lagna, actually, mm -hmm. but let's just see what a person is. If Jupiter's there, they'll be a spiritual person, meaning they'll be full of wisdom 
and knowledge and advice. So they may become a counselor as a career. So we can only have the career of who we are. And so Jamie answers the career question by seeing who we are. And then when the dasha comes, say you've got Jupiter, which is shown you're going to be a counselor. And say you go into the dasha of Rahu, and Rahu's in the Shad Vargas of Jupiter, um, or conjunct Jupiter or whatever. Now, during that dasha, the person may work as a counselor. And different people do different jobs throughout the life often, right? Like I was an athlete yeah. as a kid. Yeah, know? exactly. Right. Yeah. So um, that's due to the change of the dashas and what of the self planets the dasha is bringing to life. And so that's how we see the career. And in Germany, they also use, like you said, Atma Karka, and then they have the Amatya Karka, which is like the right of the Atma Karka, and then the concept of Karam Kangsha to see the career of a person, like the Lord of the Arudha Lagna in the Namansha will show the career. Is that one of the parts? No, of the that's, there's a lot of made up Jamini stuff. Okay. Jamini is real simple. Okay, the Atma Karka is the minister, it represents right. your friends. So you want to see what kind of careers your friends have, you need to study Atmakarika, okay? Or yeah. Atmataya Karika, okay? The, the AMK as it's called. Yeah. To find the career of yourself, it's real simple. You simply see the Atmakarika to start with, mm -hmm. and you see the planets conjunct the Atmakarika, and the sign that Atmakarika is in and take its lord. And you do that in Rashi and Navamsha. Then some careers require multiple planets and might require or accept a planet in the fifth from Atmakarika. Um, for instance, an astrologer could be made by K2 in the first, second, third, or fifth from Atmakarika. Now, just because K2 is there doesn't automatically make a person an astrologer. Then K2 also needs to be aspected in the Rashi chart by the planet that, by the house lords that represent, represent astrology. Because you have to have the concrete realization of that career, which are the Bhavas. Bhavas are the concrete existing thing. Right. Everyone born within a few hours, couple hours, is going to have same Atmakarika, right? Same Rashi, but not same career. Why is that? Because we have to verify the career in the D60, the Shashti Amsha Varga, which changes every two minutes. So if I see an astrologer in the Rashi, I have to see it in the Shashti Amsha in order for them to truly become an astrologer. Otherwise, it's in a potential that's never realized. Like Jamie said, Hora Adaya Siddha, perfection comes from using the Hora and other Varga charts. Otherwise, we're taking, we're showing, if we just study the Rashi and the Navamsha for the career planets, and then we tighten down on the specific career, because Venus can give many careers. It can make you a stripper. It can make you a movie producer. It can make you um, sell eyeglasses. It can make you um, do massage. Yeah. Um, it can make you sell vehicles. You know, so many things Venus can do as a career. But if you have Venus as a career planet, it can make you an interior decorator. Which one of those are you going to do? Yeah. That depends on the Bhavas. Like in my Jamie class, I have a lot of list of careers. What, what's the difference between the girl who goes and wants to act and the girl who wants to become a ballet dancer and the girl who ends up being an exotic dancer? It's the Bhavas. They all have a lot to do with Venus, obviously. But it's the Bhavas that pinpoint, okay, this person is an erotic dancer, this person is a ballet dancer, and this person is a script writer. Although they all work in a Venetian entertainment field, right? Yeah. So um, there's all these subtleties to that, and career is so complicated these days. And oh, yeah, there's the, many careers now. And the subtleties. Yeah. And, you know, 500 years ago in India, live in a small village, there was three things you could do, right? Yeah. What are you going to do? You're going to do what your father did. So yeah. there's nothing on predicting career in the other books. Yeah. It's not there. It tells you how you might get money because money can come from unexpected sources, you know, an uncle, an elephant, you know, who knows. But yeah. as far as career, there's nothing on that. So people have used these sutras about where your money comes from to help with the career. And that's a good thing to do. But first we need to see who the person is, meaning what their path can be, which because the career is the path that we're on, essentially. Yeah. And once we know that, when we see a career planet that can also that's getting activated to give money, they're going to get money through their career. But they also may just be, a person may be an astrologer, that might be who and what they are, but getting all their money from their spouse and they just do readings for free. They're still right. an astrologer and maybe the yeah. best astrologer in the world, right? Yeah. Um, where they don't charge for readings. So they're not getting money from astrology, but they are an astrologer. 
So Jamie covers all that. So really, Jamie is remarkable. So is Parashar. I mean, the profundity of the, those two Vedic texts. You could burn every other astrology book on the planet, and if you just have those two books, a person can be a master of astrology. Wow. That's so, how uh, Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and as far as the career concern, do you ever look at the Tasamsha? The D10 chart, or do you only go to the D60 chart um, regarding we need that? A, we need to see the career in the Rashi, confirm yeah. in the Hashti Amsha. If it's indicated in the Das Amsha, they'll become more famous and successful at it. But see, after Jamie tells us about the career, how to see what plants will give her a career, he next talks about the 10th Baba. And the Das Amsha, of course, relates to the 10th Baba. And the 10th Baba mm -hmm. is more your capability with your career. How good are you at it? And Jamie has very specific, some very interesting um, principles influencing like the 10th from Atmakarika, 10th from Pada to show if a person is doing, does a great job or a terrible job or a mediocre job. And anytime you go to any astrologer, you should look and see are they capable, incapable, or amazing. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Jamie tells us how to do that. And that's where the 10th house and the Dasamsha comes on. An important thing about the Dasamsha that people don't realize. Parshar tells us that Asamsha is about um, Mahat Falam, great fruit. The Asamsha is about the biggest things in your life that you're gonna that are gonna be most visible in your life. Because it's tenth Baba, it's up there, it's what's most apparent, yeah. right? So that may be you doing a great career famously, but it, it also may be the most significant thing about you is that you're a nobody married to Angelina Jolie, right? Yeah, and that fact that you're married to an amazing, famous woman like Angelina Jolie is going to be indicated in your Dasamsha. It's the most amazing thing about you. Okay, I see. So it's the it's the great fruits. Now, most of the time, the greatest fruits in our lives are the result of our career. Okay, um, and it'll show the greatest moments in our career. So it's essential for timing things like winning elections or having great career periods, but it's not essential for what we do. For a person may be an astrologer, nobody knows it. And he's married to Angelina Jolie, and he's famous for being married to Angelina Jolie, right? Married to Jolie, yeah. Okay. So, um, but if the career is also indicated in the Dasamsha, then the person will be, greatness will certainly come from their career. You understand? And are you looking at the entire chart in the Dasamsha, or are you looking at the 10th floor of the Lagna? in the Dasamsha or just the 10th floor of the Dasamsha. Okay, well when it comes to seeing if the career is indicated in the Dasamsha, we have to use all yeah. the houses. So say houses. that Venus is the career planet and mm -hmm. it's showing that they're going to be a dancer in the Rashi chart. So a dancer, to be a dancer you have to use your body. So yeah. Venus has to be influenced by body. Yeah. To be a dancer you have to move, which is third Baba. So Venus mm -hmm. needs to be influenced by third Baba. To be a dancer, the public has to see your Venus, which is seventh Baba. So mm -hmm. when Venus is a career planet influenced by third Lord or third Baba, first Lord, first Baba, or um, and seventh, all three seventh. of those, then the yeah. person becomes a dancer. If Saptamsha is yeah. not there, they'll dance in the shower. That's it. Or exactly. if the seventh Baba is not there, they only yeah. dance and no one will see them <laughs> back, right? They might be the yeah. most amazing dancer, but the public yeah. will see them. So then we would look for those same things in the Dasamsha to see if it all adds up there too. So I we see. look at that for everything. But when it comes, every Baba has a every Varga has a critical planet and a critical house. So in Dasamsha, to get the foundation of a person's potential for greatness, we have to examine the tenth Baba cusp, and not the tenth Rashi, but we take the tenth cusp from the Rashi chart and calculate its Dasamsha. The mm -hmm. same way we take the Lagna from the Rashi and calculate its, you know, the right. subject. And then we need to um, look at Saturn. Saturn is the key planet in the Dasamsha. Okay? If Saturn's strong in the Dasamsha and the 10th Bob is strong and the 10th Lord is solid, that's a great Dasamsha that will give great fruits. If those three mm -hmm. things are shattered, the person won't utilize that Vargas healthily. Same with Navamsha. Right. Venus is debilitated. Oh, the yeah. Venus is debilitated, and the ninth lord is in bad shape, and your ninth cusp is beat up. Marriage won't work. You'll, yeah. you'll never be happy in marriage. Um, and then also for marriage, you have to look at Saptamsha. 
because the partnership is the saptamsha. The yeah. marriage is the navamsha. The difference is marriage is an ashram that puts you on a narrow path in life. It limits your choices in life. And being on a narrow path helps you focus on things and you become greater. And if you have a very wide path, then you just wobble around and you never get anywhere, right? So the ashram narrows, narrows the path. And the navamsha is the, mar the marriage is the, one of the possible ways of having a narrow path in life. So, but the saptamsha is the partnership. What the two people produce with each other that they wouldn't produce alone. So it's seen for children because you're not going to have a baby by yourself, okay? Yeah, exactly. But there's millions of other things that you might have never have done if you didn't meet that person. Absolutely. Okay? Like me and my wife got good subtumptious. My wife programs my astrology. She works as an pro astrology programmer. These are things she would have never wow. done if she hadn't yeah. met me. So sometimes you'll see a relationship where the two people – they don't have a strong septumsha, so they never do anything due to the other person. Meaning, if that person had, if they hadn't met that person, their lives would not be any different. And other people have a great septumsha, they meet someone because they met that person, they do so much more than if they hadn't met that person, or so many different things that they would have never have done. And that's really what makes relationships really rewarding. If you're with someone that you're doing things that you wouldn't have done by yourself, it adds to your life. If you're with someone who you're not doing anything different than if you were all alone, then are they really work worth all the headaches and all the trouble and the fact that you got to be there at a certain time for somebody? Not as much, right? right. So for a great marriage, one great septumsha, so people are co-creating together, children and other things as well. As the more, mm -hmm. the better, because then they have a true active partnership where people are bringing things in that they wouldn't have had with by themselves. So, but then to be married and feel satisfied in that narrow path, that's the Navamsha. I and see. So, so when people, yeah. so there's like this mundane definition say that Namansha is the fruit of the Lagna chart, meaning that if you have weak planets in Lagna and strong planets in Namansha, that means your life will become strong eventually with time and you will gain wealth. So is Namansha is what it's set out to be that it will show your second part of life where it will show that you what you will become and how planets are really judged through Nemancha chart and some astrologers go first on Nemancha more than even Lagna. I've seen those astrologers. Yes. So what is your take on this? Nemancha and Rashi are very interrelated and the reason is okay Rashi charts number one. Nemancha chart is number of houses? Nine right? Nine. Okay yeah. number nine. One and nine are the same and are different ends of the same stick okay and what we can say is the number nine is just looking at number one with our understanding okay so say you give a baby the number one like you give him mm -hmm. a, a piece of plastic shaped like number one okay yeah he's gonna look at the number one and he's just gonna see number one and there's gonna be no understanding of it he'll suck on it He'll take it and dig it in the dirt. He doesn't know what number yeah. one is for. Okay? Yeah. Whereas a person who's lived and has developed ideas about things, and you give them a number one, they're going to look at the number one and say, I remember my first girlfriend. I remember my first job. Uh, I remember, you know, number one is integral to mathematics, and I'm a mathematician, you know. So they're gonna, yeah. there's going to be ideas about that number one. That's number nine. So number nine is just looking at number nine with intelligence and ideas, okay? So what we have is we're on a path on life, and that path is has its is, has its difficult parts and its easy parts, and that path is indicated by the Rashi chart. So as we go down that path, if you have a terrible Rashi chart, everything is going to be hard. Mm -hmm. If you have a great Rashi chart, everything's easy. So you could be on a path that's uphill into the snow with cactuses rolling down the hills at you right. where every moment's painful or you can have a path that's downhill in a Ferrari right yeah. uh, with a beautiful woman driving it and mm -hmm. you know and sunny spring and fruit trees yeah. okay 
And none of us have either of those, thank goodness. We're in the middle somewhere, right? Right. Well, that's the path. Now, along that path, many, many things will happen. You're going to meet lots of people along that path. So you drive down the path and you see a beautiful girl sitting there by the fruit tree. You see her. She's on the path. But do you get out of the car and talk to that girl and get to know her and marry her? That's the Varga charts now. We drive down the path, there's all this money. And do we get out and get the money or not? Or when we get out, does somebody jump on us, beat us up, and take the money before we get our hands on it? That's the Varga chart. So every, all, this, all the specific things of what happened along that path are the Vargas. Okay? Then how we look upon that path, how we view that path, is the Navamsha. Okay, because the path is the number one. Number nine is how we see the path based on our ideas. So everyone has ideas, right and wrong, good or good don't. I need this, I don't need this. And everything we looked at in life, we look through that paradigm of concepts and needs. So for instance, if you just hang up on me and you say, what an idiot, and you just throw the mic off and storm out of here. Right. If I need you to love me and I need you to tell everyone and promote my video, I'm going to be really sad, right? Mm -hmm. But if I yeah. don't need you to do that, I'll just go and back to my garage, finish cleaning my garage, okay? So yeah. how it and I'll have a totally different feeling about it based on what my need is. Okay? If I think you're knowledgeable, which I think you do, first time I've talked to you, you know a lot of things I can tell. If I think you're knowledgeable yeah. and you criticize something I say, I'll think about it. Okay? Because of the fact that I think you're this. But if you criticize something I say and I didn't think you're knowledgeable, I wouldn't think about it. So right. how I respond to you being in front of my path right now has to do with what I think about you. Okay? And that's what the Navamsha is. It's, it's our ideas about everything that determines how, how we see what's in front of us. So if we're on a really hard path, but our outlook on life is such that we feel we're supposed to be there, we're happy to live with it. So a person's in a terrible job, it's hard, they're working several hours, they're not getting paid much, but they feel mm -hmm. like they're supposed to be in that job, the mm -hmm. burdens are bearable, right? Yeah. If we're in a great job getting paid lots of money, we got a beautiful secretary, and we just feel like we're supposed to be doing something else, we'll be miserable yeah. there, right? Miserable, yeah, oh yeah. So Definitely. the Navamsha lets us, is the foundation of how, it's how strongly anchored we are on our path. Mm -hmm. Okay. What happens when someone gets divorced? The Navamsha is shattered, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, they don't know where they're at in life. They don't know what to expect, what to hope for. They, their path yeah. has just been melted down. They have, they're still on the path. They're still going down the road. But they don't have any security on that path. They're not grounded in the foundation of that path. So the Navamsha is the foundation of the path that we're on. And more importantly, it's how we view that path. If we're running the dasha of a planet that's solid in the Navamsha but trashed in the Rashi, we're on a hard path. But we feel like we're supposed to be there, we feel right about being there, and we manage it no problem. If the opposite right. happens, even if we're on a good if we're on a bad path and a bad Navamsha, not only do we hate the road because it's so hard, but yeah. we really don't want to be there. We don't see any yeah. reason to be there. And as soon as we can, we're gonna leave. And what happens? We leave the path. We divorce. We leave the ashram. And, you know, there's three paths, brahmachari, right? Marriage path and ashram path. Mm -hmm. Whatever that path is, if you're not secure in it, you'll eventually leave it if you have a bad navamsha. That's why I see a lot of people in the New Age community have a very hard time sticking to any path. They jump between marriage, ashram, and brahmachari, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. like musical chairs. Exactly. Because they have a bad navamsha. And other people, though, they're like solid on their path. There's a good Navamsha. So Navamsha is cr more critical for our sense of life because what happens doesn't matter. It's our ideas about how we see things happening and our security along that path that matters. Um, and also there's a misconception that most people don't believe in, but I, I feel I believe in and I have dealt and I've used it in my life is that all the Varga charts should be looked at like a Rashi chart. They should have yogas, they should have aspects, conjunctions, you know, all the um, avastas and everything. You should see in the uh, Nimansha and every other, uh, you know, Saptamesh, the Samsha chart. Is that true that you also look at the yogas, the conjunction and aspect it, forming? It's, 
it's like everything else with astrology we can never say something's true or false because we always have to take the context of it being what context we're using that okay so yeah. there are some yogas that are just meant for the Rashi chart mm -hmm. but then there's some yogas meant for all charts so it depends on the yoga we're talking about then there's different types of aspects okay then there's um, let's see how can I say it best essentially we have to understand that astrology is a ast astronomy okay if the astronomy is faulted the astrology yeah. cannot be scientific it might still right. work because we have intuition okay yeah yeah but it won't be scientific we could never get a computer to make it work right we have to use and then certain things like combustion and retrogression mm -hmm. of course those are astronomical facts in the sky that are yeah. easily seen in the Rashi chart, but they are that way in e everywhere because they don't change. Um, waning and waxing moon doesn't change in a Varga. You know, things like yeah. this. Now, aspects, there's Rashi aspects and planetary aspects. Rashi aspects are sign based, planetary aspects are degree based, they're spatially based. Mm -hmm. Especially the way Parashar tells us to use them by actually calculating out the exact aspect based on the exact degrees, not just using full aspects and so on. And it's my yeah. opinion that when it comes to those planetary aspects, we need to use those in the Rashi and carry them over into the Varga charts. But Rashi aspects I, I use in each Varga independently. So the reason for that is Parashar tells us the Rashi chart is Deha. It's the body, right? Mm -hmm. So anything we're going to predict about has a body. Your wallet has a body. Your children have yeah. a body. Your watch has body, right? So the body is always a manifestation of everything inside. That's why we can look at your nose and make some say something. We can say, look at your hands and say something, right? We can look at your hairline and make some about you, right? Because the yeah. body is a manifestation of everything of that thing, right? So the body has to reflect what's really there. So if I was a great reader, you can I could look at your wallet, and due to the scratches on the wallet and the threads torn out, I could predict what's going to happen to your wealth. Okay? Yeah. Raha Mihira used to do that with swords. He would look at a warrior's sword, based on where the nicks were, make a prediction about the person's life. Okay? Yeah. So the body always tells the facts because the facts are in the body. So if we use different planetary aspects in the Varga charts, we get a different story there than we see in the body, right? But it's not yeah. possible to not see something in for something to be there that we can't see in the body, even if it's very okay. subtle. So right. because of that, with planetary aspects, because they're astronomically based, they're degree based. Yeah. I use them there. And also conjunctions. If somebody wants, you know, sun and moon conjunct. For Parashar system, Parashar system is a very astronomical system. Um, Shad Bala, it's all astronomy, right? Right. All, you know, so many calculations, all which are direct, uh, you know, totally astronomy. Yeah. So, the Parashar system, if I see a planet, for instance, the moon will starve Venus, according to Shudita Avashta. So if the moon's conjunct Venus, Venus is going to get starved. As a result, the person, like Tom, it can be like Tom Cruise has Moon Venus conjunction, and yeah. relationships are going to be all about him, the moon, mm -hmm. the, the ego, and not about the relationship. Good relationships yeah. are when the relationship is about the relationship, okay? When the moon's with Venus, Venus is starved, so the relationship is starved because of the moon, the ego makes it about itself. So I'm going to consider that Moon Venus conjunction in every Varga. Now, if the moon is really strong in the Navamsha, and Venus is weak in the Navamsha, the moon is going to starve Venus really bad. Bad, yeah. Say in the Navamsha, the Venus is exalted and moon is weak. It won't be able to starve Venus as much. But in each right. Marga chart, I'll look at how much the moon is starving Venus. And moon may be sleeping. It might be debilitated, which means it's yeah. sleeping, and then it can't starve Venus at all. So in that Varga, yeah. Venus is going to do the best. Right. Okay, so that's yeah. the subtleties of the Vashtas. I can't tell you how this is like the magical formula for astrology. Most astrologers look at charts based on benefits and malefics. Mm -hmm. Benefics and malefics is a quality. 
like hot and cold. Some plants yeah. are hot, some are cold. Some are vata, some are pitta, some are kapha. Yeah. Some are male, some are female. So for me to say Saturn is going to cause trouble because he's a malefic, it's like me saying this planet's going to ruin your life because he's a male planet. That's right, a exactly, exactly. Okay? Yeah. Because Saturn is cruel because he, and the word Parashar uses is cruel, because sometimes things are just hard. If I go into my backyard and I start digging until I mm -hmm. find a big piece of gold, that's yeah. hard work, right? Hard work, yeah. It's a wonderful yeah. thing. Well, exactly. Mars rules gold mining, and Mars is a cruel, malefic planet, right? Yeah. Because it's hard to get money from Mars. If I'm the greatest martial arts expert in the world and I go around winning tournaments for $1 million and I have an amazing Mars, yeah. That's a hard life, but it's a yeah, because you're gonna you, have, you have a chance of getting beat up every time. Yeah, yeah and I'm gonna come home with bruises and breaks and exactly. hurt if I win, right? Yeah. So and even just the training hurts, right? Yeah. So Mars is cruel, Saturn's cruel, Sun is cruel. So they give us things in a cruel environment, but that doesn't mean they're gonna be givers or takers. A planet gives or takes in accordance with his ability. Just like a person. If a person has capability and support, they'll produce. If a person's incapable and everyone's taking things yeah. from them, they won't produce. Planets are the same. So with the Lajitati Vashtas, Parashara lets us see, he tells us to use, Lajitati Vashtas are largely based upon natural planetary relationships. Some planets will help another planet, other planets will detract from them. So the moon's mm -hmm. a natural enemy to Venus. So if it's making a strong influence to Venus by conjunct or opposite, it's going to starve Venus. And Venus won't be able to produce as good. But then maybe Mercury's conjunct Venus, and Mercury's a friend of Venus. Yeah. Now Venus can produce more. So what we need to look at is not benefits and malefics for the what. The benefits, well, in fact, one of Venus's friends is Saturn. Yeah. Saturn aspecting Venus makes you have a better love life. Why? Because you appreciate what you get. You're realistic about it. Saturn, mm -hmm. though, has a special rule that any time Sat any planet Saturn conjuncts gets starved. He even starves his friends via conjunction. So Saturn-Venus yeah. conjunction sucks, but Saturn-Venus aspect is nice because uh, my wife has Saturn. Venus. The strongest influence to my wife's Venus is Saturn. Mm -hmm. And she has no enemies influencing her Venus, just Saturn. She's the easiest person to be in a relationship with. She never nags, she never complains, because she's realistic. She's not expecting miracles, but then you drop the moon, make it aspect Venus, and the person the relationship yeah. is all about them. Or you yeah. put the sun with Venus, and the person's agitated. I have sun with Venus. Mom, my, <laughs> my Venus isn't as good as my wife. Yeah. I'm the one who gets irritated more than she does, you know? So, you know... The, the main important rule for studying planets is the influence of the friends and enemies according to these very specific rules. There are some very subtle rules that Parashara has. That makes all the difference in interpretations. Most people think, oh, you got a Moon-Venus conjunction. You're going to have a great relationship. Well, the person will have lots of relationships because when you just use, think people are there for you, you have lots of relationships. But your relationships yeah. don't last. Your spouse or partner will feel starved and unhappy. Absolutely. And that's what happens. Just ask Katie Holmes. Yeah. Now, one of the last uh, subjects that I will really want to talk to you about, and I don't want to take too much of your time, but how important are the nakshatras in Jyotish? And, you know, when they say that if you go to a Mahatasha of a planet, it acts as its nakshatra lord. What is the correlation there, and what is your take on the importance of nakshatras? And what is their job, actually? Okay. okay. Well, what nakshatra's job is, Mm -hmm. The Rashis are, are the concrete manifestations, okay? Okay. Now, but what grows those things? Okay, so baby comes out, right? It's a concrete yeah. manifestation. But what grew that baby? The mother. Yeah. So what, everything is grown by the mother. And the moon is the mother, right? Mm -hmm. And the moon is the master of the nakshatras, or the husband of the nakshatras. Yeah. Now... The, the, the nakshatras are the consorts of the moon. And the consorts are always the shakti or power. So the nakshatras are the power that the moon uses to grow everything in our lives. So if we have an afflicted moon, we have a bad attitude, and everything we grow in our life, we do in a bad attitude, right? Right. Okay. So 
the nakshatras represent the powers that grow everything. So Mula, for instance, has the Shakti to destroy things. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's going to grow things, by first destroying something so there's room for growth. Okay? So every nakshatra has the power to grow something. That's what they all do. They're responsible for growing everything in our lives. If a planet's in a nakshatra, that nakshatra is responsible for growing what that planet is. Now, whether it'll grow a healthy thing or a sick thing depends on that planet and the influences to it. Namely, it's Lajitadi Avashtas. But the nakshatra is growing that thing. And so the dashas, which are based on when nakshatras are getting activated, essentially allow us to see when things are growing in our lives. I see. Okay. And so, uh -huh. so let's say if uh, Mars isn't in a Saturn nakshatra, that means Mars is going to activate its energy the way Saturn does through hard work, through frustration, through delay. Um, no, you can't really do what? it that way because right. those nakshatra lords are based on Vimshatri Dasha. Right. They're not really ruling it the same way Saturn's ruling a sign. Mm -hmm. If you have a planet in a Saturn sign, it'll deal with some Saturnian qualities. Saturnian, yeah. But Saturn nakshatras are different, like the best, one of the, the second generally considered best nakshatra after Rohini is Pushya. Pushya, okay. Pushya is ruled by Saturn, okay? Mm -hmm. Pushya makes yeah. things come very nicely and easily, yet yeah. in Vimshatri it's ruled by Saturn. So we can't really use those qualities, but when we use Vimshatri Dasha, when yeah. Saturn Dasha comes along, it can activate that and grow that Mars because right. Mars is in Saturn's nakshatra. But it'll happen in a pushya fashion, and what will happen depends on the quality of Mars. So pushya makes things happen really easily. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's considered such a great nakshatra. It makes a smooth yeah. road. But if you've got Mars in pushya, and Mars is, say, conjunct Saturn and Rahu and mm -hmm. aspected by enemy Mercury, that's a yeah. trash Mars. And the only thing it's going to grow, and put in your Lagna too, the only thing it's going to grow is something that's going to destroy your body. So now it's in push your next chakra. You're going to get in a terrible accident in the smoothest possible way. <laughs> okay? Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? You're going to yeah. be enjoying your life, going down the road, looking forward to something wonderful, and boom. Okay. So is it are you looking at just the moon nakshatra and the planetary nakshatra or also what my uncle also does he uh -huh. looks at the nakshatra of the ascendant yeah. and the dasha of that planet that rules the ascendant will activate the majority uh, you know um, things that you will run into in your yeah. life. Yes. You can do the same thing. The nakshatras are also growing all the house cusps. Yeah. Okay. And okay. so whatever nakshatra the bhavakas fall in, that nakshatra is responsible for growing that thing mm -hmm. in accordance with how good that bhava is, though. Okay. The nakshatras aren't good or bad, they just grow everything. And I see. Yeah, some things, there's nice way to grow things, and then there's hard work ways to grow things. The nakshatras that people call bad, they're the nakshatras that grow things in really difficult ways. And because of that, they're ideal for growing things in bad situations. That's why some of those nakshatras are better for going to war. Because they grow things in terrible situations. A nakshatra that grows things in nice situations will be, will not really know how to manage things in a in a war. You understand? Yes. And one other thing I've saw like many like students of mine and they come up to me and they say they're learning Barashra, Gemini, Lalkita, systems approach, Nadi astrology, uh, KP astrology. And they're trying to mix and match all these together. I mean, and I'm like, you can't do all these different systems. But I wanted to know, in your, you know, expert opinion, what systems have really cut through the essence of astrology? I know Gemini has really done that, but when you look at these other systems of astrology, what is your thought on them? Like okay. Al Kitab and yeah. Nadi and Yeah, that's a great yeah. question. And really, we should have just done that first and talked about it for two hours. Yeah, yeah. So. Now, first of all, let's just go back 100 years. 100 years ago, Sri Yukteswar, Paramahansa Yogananda's guru, who was known yeah. as an astrologer, not as a mm -hmm. guru, okay? Yeah. He said, the problem with astrology, there's two problems. One is, they're using 
the old pun chunk, the old serious sedentas for calculating out planets, and those are no longer accurate. Unfortunately, there's a current movement of going back to those books. Mm -hmm. And he said they need to use modern ephemerises and calculate the planets right. He said the other problem is, is that people are not learning astrology in a systematic way. Instead, they're just learning all these yogas. And when they yeah. see a yoga, it pops out at them and they make a prediction. And in India, the way they, read, they tell a chart, they say, you have a yoga for marriage. You know? I don't say that. I say, your Venus, of, your Venus is in a good Lajitadya Vashta, and you're going into Venus Dasha, so finally you'll get a woman or man that will last. Okay? Yeah. So they use that word yoga, because that's how, and mo the, pretty much all the astrology books outside of Parashar and Jaimini are just yogas and yogas and yogas with a few small mm -hmm. things in between. Yeah. And some of those yogas are great. Yogas in itself is a school of astrology. It's a system. But it's not a systematic system. It's a system of memorizing lots of things, and when you see it, say it. Now, Sri Tarshwar said the way we have to do astrology is through a systematic, scientifically replicable method. Mm -hmm. Now, right around then, according to him, we were going into Par Yuga. Things were shifting. What yeah. happened? Brihat Parashara was discovered. It had been gone for at least 1,100 years. It was yeah. recompiled. Jamie Sutras was unearthed. And a few, mm -hmm. I think around between 1900 and 1930, the second half of Jamie Sutras was found. It wasn't even found before that. Yeah. Okay? So for the first time, around early 1900s, we have the first books that are systematic. Then KP came along. KP took and created a system based on Parashara principles. And it's a systematic thing where you apply a certain set of... What is systematic? It's applying a certain set of rules to arrive at an answer rather than memorizing lots of planetary permutations. Right. Well, KP did that. In my opinion, he's done the best job. But he only took this much of Parashara. Took a little, he took one ingredient out of Parashara and he's using it in a systematic way. But all the rest of Parashara was ignored. Then systems, then Iyer came along. Iyer developed a system um, uh, based on you know, six, eighth, and twelfth lords and combustions and extremes. Yeah. And it's a system based on some Parshar principles, but it's just this much of Parshar system. But he took a few ingredients and made a little system out of it. Right. But it's not full. Then um, systems approach came along and took a couple ideas and created a system. So in the last hundred years, we've been in the age of let's do it systematically. Let's learn a rule that we can apply to anything and therefore make a prediction. Right. But so far they're all incomplete. The mm -hmm. only complete system of doing that is Parashara. And Parashara shows us two systematic approaches. Okay. And when I say system, I mean you can use this system to read anything in life. Okay. So if you learn this one technique, which is going to have lots of steps, you can read anything in the horoscope that you want to read about. So Parashara has sort of like two systems. One system is the system of judging a bhava, and a critical part of that is judging the grahas, the planets. And that's done through Shadbala and the five avashtas. And that's it. And that's using those as a system for judging the chart. And it works amazing. Then he has a system Another part of Parashar astrology is the system of using yogas. So he gives a lot of yogas in Parashara, and we can also add all the other yogas from the other books. But his, what's unique about Parashara, he also gives a system to quantify those yogas. So you have a Gajakasara yoga. Let's put a number to your Jupiter and see, are you going to do better in your Jupiter dasha than this person with the very same yoga? Okay? Mm -hmm. Parashara creates a mathematical system, which I'm actually teaching a course on right now, of analyzing the yogas. And it's a profound difference. So he has a system of yogas. And that's the Parashara system. And that's the only system we should use in Parashara astrology. We shouldn't just use a tiny bit of systems approach, a tiny bit of Iyer, and a tiny bit of KP, and forget the Avashtas yeah. and Shadbala, and calculated aspects, and Ishta, Kashta, Shuba, Ashuba, all that cool stuff. Yeah. And I'm, for the first time, teaching this system currently. After I get done with the yoga system, yogas are nice because it gives you a good, fast outlook on the chart. 
the Avastia system is like hardcore analysis. You have to get down and really work the chart. And I'll be teaching that next. Now, Jaimini is the other branch of astrology. It's not a system, though, in the sense that you learn one technique and can read everything with it. Okay, Jaimini has a whole bunch of systematic right. techniques for specific areas. So Jaimini is specific. This technique only works for predicting marriage, okay? It won't work on anything else. This technique only works to give an idea of the heights a person can achieve. It won't work on anything else. Yeah. So Jamie gives the specific techniques, and those, of course, are systematic. So the only books we need should be studying are those, with a couple extra add-ons from the other texts, in my opinion. And once we've perfected all the small techniques of Jamie and the, and the Parashar systematic techniques, we won't need anything else. Right. But see, I mean, and then, then there's a problem of the Ayanamsha, like the KP uses the Placidus houses, and then there's Narayani Bhauchalit's chart, which moves your planet from one house to the next. What is your opinion on that? Like, when you see the uh, Narayan Bhauchalit's chart, and the moon goes into the previous house and suddenly is now excelled, do you use that system, or do you think that system, okay. a, system is. Good? Okay. Um. That system is critical to astrology, but it has to be used right. So, for instance, okay. when we talk about planets and houses from the Lagna or yeah. from any other planet, we need to count full Rashis. But what's, in, what's critical is the Bhavakas. So, say I want to read about your brother's life. Mm -hmm. I need to take the third Bhavakas, read it in the Rashi chart. And that may be in the third sign, but it might be in the fourth or second sign, right? Yeah. I have to take that Bhavakas, read that cusp in the Rashi, calculate the Navamsha of that cusp to predict about his marriage, calculate the Dasamsha of that cusp to predict about his greatness. So I calculate all those cusps in all the Vargas, and then they're not in, in order. They don't, they're not in order. It might be first cusp, tenth cusp, eighth cusp, seventh cusp, because we're calculating the cusp the same way we are the planets. Cusps are critical points. The cusp of the Baba, that's the only point that matters. That point is the concrete existing thing. And we need to calculate that point in every Varga the same way we calculate the Lagna in every Varga and read that point. Okay, so um, if I want to predict about your marriage, I'm going to study the seven cusp in your Septumsha. Okay? If I want to look about your spouse's health, I'll look at the seven cusp in your trim sumsha. So we have to use those cusps. But when it comes to dividing the space and saying the plants and this and this baba, I don't find yeah. using cusp to divide that space work. Okay. For that we have so, to, so if a yoga says, you know, Jupiter's in the eighth, we have to look at the eighth Rashi from the ascendant, not right. the eighth cusp, not the, not the cuspal space. You understand? So, if the, so the Narayan, the, the Bhautalit or Narayan Bhautalit chart you're saying, it's something that is not valid when you are using the barkas or that the chart is not valid, but the cusps are valid. The cusps are valid. The cusps right. are not only valid, they're critical. In fact, I develop a technique using transits based on the transits and follow the pika, using those cusps calculated in all the vargas, where you okay. can perfectly predict the day of every event in your life. And if somebody just gives you three events to the exact day, you can rectify their chart down to the second, using wow. those cusps. But Placida system won't work. Placida system is is ridiculous. The reason is, Placida system cannot be calculated north or south of the polar circle. Right. Instead, it then swaps over to Porphyry system, which is the same as Sri Pati, which is a ridiculous system in itself because it uses local space and then divides local space by zodiacal space, and that's kind of like mixing apples and oranges. Right. There's only two possible systems that will work, and that is Campania system and Regia Montanus. Um, I found Campania system to work amazingly, and I use the cusp broken down into the Varga charts, Shashtiamsha and everything, and predict transits to the exact day and other events to so the exact day oh, using those okay. cusps. Wow, I can just keep talking and talking to you, but I mean, this is this was just the most informative interview I've done so far, and I really would love for you to come uh, sure. again and again on my channel. Sure. But for all these 
uh, 14,000 people who are now watching and many who are going to be watching it later on. Uh, can you please uh, tell us if they want to get a consultation from you or learn more Jyotish from you, how can they get in touch with you? Okay. Um, I have several websites. One is okay. vedic-astrology.net. That's okay. the site where I have a lot of audio courses. I have some free articles on that site. Um, I have lots of audio courses and books for sale. Then I have astrology-videos.com where I've got online video membership. You pay a monthly fee to watch as many videos as you want. There's over 300 hours of video on the site currently and I add several videos you know, per month. Um, that's the easiest and cheapest way to learn. Okay. Um, I have a report site, vaultoftheheavens.com, where I have a lot of really good relationship-centered reports. Um, as far as readings, I'm trying to get back to people who emailed me 18 months ago. So I'm like, I don't have much time for readings because I'm constantly okay. doing writing and researching. Um, I try to squeeze them in when I can, but unfortunately, if you know viewers start contacting me for readings, I'm gonna have to say no until I get caught up. I also just moved recently, and so there's so, so much to do in the house to get settled. Absolutely. The way. Um, I hope to start catching up on readings in the fall. Okay. God willing. <laughs> but um. Wow. But yeah, for when it comes to education, mostly I spend, you know, teaching is my priority. When I have time after that, I'll fit the readings in that I can. So. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, okay. thank you so much for enlightening us with your presence, and okay. I hope to have you more on this channel. Thank yeah, you so much. Fun. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Bye -bye. Okay.